أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الأولي فلا شيء قبله والآخر فلا شيء بعده والظاهر فلا شيء دونه والباطني فلا والظاهر فلا شيء فوقه والباطني فلا شيء دونه نحمد الله سبحانه وتعالى على ما هدانا ولولا أن هدانا الله لما اهتدينا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله على محمد وآل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلوات اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد I had a few introductions in mind but I would like to make a quick shift given the presence in the audience I would like Whoever is under the age of 15 to stand up or raise their hand if they're shy from standing up. And I saw a few others are running around. Any others? Okay, fine. Under 18. Okay, alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair. Loud salawat for these people, brothers and sisters. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونفس وما سواها فالهمها فجورها وتقواها قد أفلح من زكاها وقد خاب من دساها آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم الله سبحانه وتعالى in the Quran relates to us in this ayah and I'll explain to it in two seconds what it means Allah سبحانه وتعالى according to the مفسرين of Quran the translators and interpreters of the Quran that Allah سبحانه وتعالى uses certain swears he swears, good swears of course um, swears by something in the Quran for two purposes either to place emphasis on what he's going to talk about next or to actually place emphasis and importance on the very thing by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran is swearing to us by for example in Surah Al-Asr Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wal-Asr inna al-insana lafi khusr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by time to then place emphasis on the next topic which he wants to talk about which is the fate of humanity. Okay? In another ayah or another surah rather, in Surah Al Tariq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, wa Sama'i wa Tariq. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by the skies and the stars to later talk about another topic which is the nafs. And Najm al Thaqib, and then he talks about the nafs. Places importance on the nafs. So he swears by something to place importance on something else. And in the ayah that I started with, or the few ayahs that I started with, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preceded. This is from Surah Al Shams, as you already know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by a multitude of things. He swears, wa shamsi wa duha. He swears by the sun, by the morning. Wal qamari da talaha, by the moon that follows the sun. He swears by the day. He swears by the night. He swears by the sky, he swears by the earth. Later on, he then swears by this, the nafs itself, and then by himself. He swears by the nafs, and he swears by himself. To put emphasis on a very important topic which he addresses in this ayah, which is the nafs, the self. Is the ayah uh, preludes to us that it has two components, this nafs. A path that goes towards good, which brings flourishment towards zakaha or zakat, comes from elevation of the self. The saha also has the potential to take a downward turn and lose the dunya and akhirah. And the reason I'd like to bring this about is because in our life we live in a day or we live in a world of cause and effect. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give us tools by which we can succeed in this life. Because the ultimate effect 
quote unquote, or the outcome that we are trying to achieve all of us is at the end of the day, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and knowledge, true knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hopefully acceptance of, from that pleasure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows upon us to hopefully be up in his abode when we meet him on that day of judgment. Let's look at the Prophet peace be upon him and what he focused on at the beginning and his mission. As a matter of fact, before even his mission as a true Prophet, the Prophet peace be upon him represented this mentorship of Tazkiyat and Nafs, which is the topic that I want to relate to the character that was chosen for today's talk. And inshallah, I'll be very quick because I know it's, it's, it's been a long night and Jazakumullah khair for your patience. Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the very beginning was known as a Sadiq al amin from the true noble characteristics that he carried, Jazakumullah khairan, the true noble characteristics that he carried from the very, his very inception. And then, later on, as he became a prophet, he emphasized on a number of qualities which always resonated around this topic of Tazkiyat and Nafs. For example, he says in one hadith, Al-Islam al muamala and one of the brothers was uh, alluding to this uh, topic in his uh, discussion, that Islam, submission, is really, it's, it's a small hadith, but it carries a lot of meaning. Islam al muamala means Islam is the way that we deal with one another. That we deal with brothers and sisters, that we deal with other humans, that we deal with anything on this earth for that matter. He also, in a number of other narrations, for example, لَنْ يُؤْمِنَ أَحَدَكُمْ حَتَّى يُحِبِّ الْأَخِيهِ مَا يُحِبِّ لِنَفْسِهِ The Prophet peace be upon him is emphasizing that the faith that we are aiming to achieve will not be achieved until we love for others what we love for ourselves. Other narrations, خَلَقِ النَّاسِ بِخُلْقًا حَسَنًا Treat people with a positive manner, with good manners. And so on and so forth. And even after the concept of achieving Islam and Iman, and the Quran also emphasizes in many ayat, one of them, iman, for example. And that's why I emphasized at the beginning this is a good swear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by. Because in the Quran, we, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches a number of morals to protect this nafs. Okay? Are there repercussions if we don't look after that nafs, that self? Of course there is. And even from the very beginning, since I brought that as an example, we see the example of Abu Lahab, who in the Quran was condemned. As a matter of fact, many narrations say that when the Prophet was going from one place to the other to publicize Islam, Abu Lahab used to indulge in vulgar language, in, in bad words, in bad demeanor. What is that negative effect in this character, for, for example? We see a negative effect of obviously uh, an atmosphere where people don't want to speak with him. But the other thing is that this kind of behavior prevents us from escalating in faith, from reaching even the status of faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and true recognition. And that's obviously one of the points that led to his disbelief. And in such an extreme case, he was classified as a disbeliever and condemned in the Quran. Tazkiyat al nafs, development of the soul, reaching inshallah the state of true worship, and then finally acceptance by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which brings us to a point. There are different kinds of worship. And Imams, again, as alluded by many other beautiful lectures, mashallah, tell us that there's three different types of worship, Imam Ali alayhi salam. He says, some people worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of the uh, wish for entering paradise, the joys of paradise. That type of worship, he classifies it as the worship of traitors. He also says there is a second type. Again, we know this, but I'm inshallah elaborating for the younger crowd. The second type of worship is that of worship because of fear of hell. And that worship is the worship of <coughs> the greedy. And finally, the last type of worship is that of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for recognizing for what He truly is. And that is the worship of free men or free humans, if you will men and women. And inshallah that brings us now to the character which we will discuss today very briefly. Al-Hur uh, ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Al-Hur's name, for those of us that uh, may not know, Al-Hur actually means free. And uh, as you can see where I'm heading with this, 
the reason I chose Hur is because I saw examples in him of Tazkiyat al-Nafs, or rather the choice of Tazkiyat al-Nafs as a topic today for Hur was because of many examples that Hur displayed to us and taught us the importance of Tazkiyat al-Nafs to reach that ultimate status of recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and finally to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with true submission. We begin by looking at the history of Hur in that he was amongst the uh, men of authority in Kufa. He was sent, as we know, to stop Imam Hussein from the mission that he had towards Kufa. He was sent with 1,000 men to impede the progress of Imam Hussein and to particularly with the one mission of taking Imam Hussein then to Kufa so that he can pay allegiance to Yazid. We begin by witnessing the uh, encounter between Hur and Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Imam Hussein inquires to Hur, uh, are you here for us or are you here against us? And Hur says, no, I've been sent against you and with the mission to take you to Ibadillah ibn Ziyad, yourself, Hussein alayhi salam, and we go there together. And Imam Hussein says, well, we're not here for any uh, call of enmity. We're only here, and I'm personally here, and these are my supporters, because the people of Kufa themselves came and asked for me. Of course, by this time, Imam Hussein is aware of what's going on, but he's clarifying the situation to Hur. Then Imam Hussein recognizes that Hur is not going to budge. He says, that's it. I want to take you to uh, Abaydullah ibn Ziyad, and you have to stop your mission. So Imam Hussein has to do something here. So Imam Hussein, what he does, he reminds, he says, he takes the benefit of the doubt, and he reminds the people that were there, that you are the very people that called for me. I didn't come from my own will. You're the one who called for me, and I came and answer for your own calling. This took place before the prayer of Zuhur, subhanAllah. Then the call is made. Imam makes a choice for her. He says, how do you want to lead your people since you came and uh, led them up to this point? He said, no, you pray and we'll pray behind you. Keep this in, in mind, brothers and sisters, as we relate the story related to our life, how we sometimes, even though in a state of submission, or seemingly state of submission, do some things for the sake of God, but then do other things which are counteracting our very actions. In this case, we're praying behind the Imam, but yet we're standing in his way. The prayer happens, then they award their Qiyam, they come back, the call for Asr is made, Imam prays, and then goes and again reminds the people, O oh people, we are the people of Ahlul Bayt. You are the uh, so-called Muslims that call for us to support you. As you know, this is our status as Ahlul Bayt. We're not here for worldly reasons, etc., etc. How comes back to uh, Imam Hussein and says, Imam, I am not aware of what you're talking about when it comes to the letters and people's calling you. So Imam orders his companions to show her proof. Here's the proof. Here's a few folders with a bunch of letters written by your own hands to come for my support. Her looks at them, he looks back at Imam and says, but Imam, I'm not one of those people. We are not one of those people that wrote for you. So unfortunately, I will have to stick to my mission. Don't worry, I'm not here to kill you. I'm here coming on a mission to take you to Abaydullah ibn Ziyad so that we can uh, negotiate. And the back and forth goes between the two. Finally, Hur realizes Imam Hussein is not going to go ahead with his request. So what does he do? He wants to advise Imam. And so he says, Imam, I'd like to share with you something. You know, in case you're thinking of, uh, you know, going on with a fight or a war, Allah. I want to warn you that the end may not be very favorable to you. As a matter of fact, uh, you are likely to be killed. And if that were to happen, this will sadden me. This would not be a good situation for you. So Imam Hussain looks at him and he responds, Abil Mawti Tukhawifuni, do you scare me with death? Brothers and sisters, this is the same Imam, the grandfather of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq who taught us. Remember death 70 times during the day, and you will never sin. This is just another day. And now Hur is telling Imam, watch out, death is coming your way. And when Imam noticed that Hur is not really getting the message of why he's really truly there, 
Imam looks at her and says, her, I, I'm not sure how to really convince you of why I'm here, but I'm going to respond to you the same way that Akhul Aus responded to his cousin when his cousin was telling him that Akhul Aus's support for the Prophet is going to end in a futile way. And he responds with this small lines of poetry. إذا ما نوى حقا وجاهد مسلما وآسى الرجال الصالحين بنفسه وفارق مذبورا وبعد مجرما فإن عشت لم أندم وإن مت لم أندم كَفَى بِكَ ذَلًّا أَنْ تَعِيشَ وَتَرْغَمَ صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Before I translate, I want to shed light on one of the things which I noticed in Hur's characters which relate to this Kiyat al-Nafs. What did Hur do when Imam was saying that I came in answer to your own calling? Hur first acknowledged his deficiency, his uh, lack of knowledge of this, uh, this issue, which reflects one of the characteristics that lead, that allow us to head to that path of Tazkiyat al-Nafs, which is Ikhlas, true sincerity and truthfulness. That's one of the characteristics that is seen here, but Imam wants to, he sees something rather in Hur and wants to elabor elaborate on it. What did he see? He saw determination. He saw Hur was determined to do something. Hur came with a specific mission. Take the Imam, go to Ayatollah ibn Ziyad, that's it. No war, nothing. What the Imam wants to teach, Hur, that that determination of yours, that's a good thing. But we, we, we want to sh show you the true determination. What is that true determination? He shares these lines of poetry. He tells him, truly, I will depart. I will, I will depart, but death is no shame on a human being. But there's a shart, there's a, there's a reason why it's no shame. So long as that person, so long as that person strived in the path of truth and struggled to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So he's teaching him, what is the determination for? What is that determination? And he continues, struggles amongst men with his own self. And he leaves away. He stays away from those whose life and end is deteriorating and the criminals. And we know who they are in this case. Then he tells him at the end, should Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose for me to live, I will not be regretful for anything. And should I also die, then I also will not die in regret because I struggled. But if you were to live and accept oppression, live by oppression and accept oppression, you shall accept an humiliation as an end result for you. So that's the second thing. The first thing that he teaches us is ikhlas. The second thing is azima in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is a lesson taught by Imam Hussein indirectly. Let us now step back and look at the situation as a whole. Looking at the Hur's, Hur's uh, position and look at Imam's position. We brothers and sisters know that we have an Imam of our time as well. And the question was posed, should Imam appear? What is our position before the Imam? I would like to propose another question. What is the position of our submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and true ikhlas to the Imam now, that he has not appeared publicly. He is amongst us. There are hadith that he hears and knows uh, what we are going to say before we even say it, a split second. Before it comes to the ear, it is already at the Imam's desk. Something to contemplate about, inshallah. But the reason why I'm bringing this question is because we see a man here, Hur, is no different from Allah and many of us in terms of living on this earth. And this man came in the way of the, uh, the Imam. He thought that he's doing his job. Now let's ask ourselves another question. How many things do we do in life 
that impede the way of the Imam? Did we know that some of our sins and actions that we do in life impede the way of Imam towards us? When we say, Allahumma ajil falajil Imam, but then either in public or in private, conduct in ways, or conduct in sins that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept, or do things that defy the cause of Imam. Some other lessons that Hur wants to teach us is our ability to stand in the way of wrong despite the consequences that face us, which brings us to the latter parts of his story. And that he and the 1,000 people that came with him to bring Imam Hussein then to Abaydullah ibn Ziyad, they were followed by 4,000, according to some narration, people led an army of 4,000 led by Amr ibn Sa'ad. So that army now is coming for a different mission. That army is here to attack the Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And when they reached, when they reached the site where all this is happening, uh, Hur had no choice. He was told that he has to join forces with these people and attack. Now he has to review his mission. He realized now this is really heading towards a wrong road. And especially that we're facing the son, the grandson of the Prophet. What are we to do here? Am I to go ahead and continue as my authority is calling for? Continue my duty that I came here for? So, struck by disbelief, he faces. He goes and faces Umar ibn Sa'd. He says, what is the intent that you're here for? He says, by Allah, my intent is none other than killing Hussein and his followers. He says, you are attempting to kill the grandson of the Prophet. Is this for real? He tries to put some sense into him. But he realizes that that's it, this is the mission. So now, he's faced by finally one last hope or one last fork in his road. Which is to choose the path of good versus evil. And he even says that I am choosing between heaven and hell. But by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I shall choose none other than heaven, even if it should cause my own death, my own body to be cut into pieces to be more elaborate. And so finally, we see two more lessons. One of them is really al-nahi an al-munkar. We hear it many times elaborated on the member, al-amr bil-ma'roof wa nahi al-munkar, but that's something we want to ask ourselves. Did we achieve it? Because really it's a component of tiskiyat al-nafis, the purification of the soul, elevation of that soul. And al-hur did that by standing against the evil at the beginning, trying his best, and finally, choosing at the end to do one more thing, which is Tawbah. He recognized that he did something wrong or he's about to do something even worse that may not be forgiven for at all. So he looks at the camp of Imam Hussein, trembling, not sure of what to do, but finally, with his own strength, walks over to Imam and says, Imam, I seek forgiveness from you, from God. Will you accept my Tawbah? Imam looks at him and says, I will. And so did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, Imam, you saw that I was the first to be in your way towards Kufa. Let me be the first to die in your way amongst these great martyrs that we heard about today. And I don't want to be too long on his brothers and sisters, but he violently, uh, he, go, he bravely goes into the battlefield and uh, in order to shorten the uh, the eulogy that uh, is included for this. But basically, he's, he gives himself up for Islam and teaches us with that a lesson. A lesson that the path of Tazkiyat al-Nafis that we are trying to achieve is really a mechanism by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to show us the path towards success. And there are many lessons, or many ways of achieving that Tazkiyat al-Nafis. Amongst them are the five that I mentioned. Ikhlas, which is sincerity in of our actions. Others are azimah, which is the continual strive and determination to really serve their imam and understand why we're serving him. And finally, jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, both the self-jihad, which is the stronger jihad, as well as jihad when we're called for it. And lastly, uh, being able to face the wrong when we witness it. And tawbah for our mistakes so that we are able to truly achieve the state of worship 
And with that, I would like us to reflect on the status that Har achieved. Can we achieve that status? Yes, we can. Is it driven by our own actions? Definitely it is. Are our actions impeding or hastening the way of Imam Ajallah Ta'ala Farajah? Definitely. So it's a reminder for you and I to continue, inshallah, in Tazkiyat al-Nafs, to seeking Tawbah, and to continually striving in the way. It's very difficult, especially in the West, for us to accomplish many of our activities as Muslims. But remember with this difficulty, there will come ease. And that all the Ansar of Imam Hussein alayhi salam achieved this and ended their life, unfortunately, unfortunately rather, fortunately with submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and giving up their souls. But unfortunately for us not being there with them so that we may attain similar uh, status, inshallah. And a question may be raised, well, where do we start? And it's a very good question. And inshallah, I'd like to end with the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in telling us a very small but very concrete hadith that we should work with that which we know for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then will teach us that which we don't know. Let's not focus too much on things bigger than our head. Let's focus on the things that we already know. اعمل بما تعلم يورثك الله علم ما لا تعلم So inshallah, I conclude with that and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiveness for anything that I have mis may have said that is wrong and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us uh, in this night and all the coming nights of Muharram and Jazakumullah khair for your patience and finally for uh, the younger crowd for putting you on the spot may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you success for taking time on this Saturday night where you could have spent it doing other things that you enjoy and sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad